Welcome to this lesson introducing Visual Basic. After reviewing this lesson, you should be able to start Visual Studio, configure Visual Studio, create a new Visual Basic Windows Forms project, close and save a Visual Studio project, open an existing Visual Studio project, manage the windows in the integrated development environment, use the toolbox window, and understand and use naming conventions. Additionally, after viewing this lesson, you will be able to set the properties of an object, use and manipulate controls, use the options on the format menu, compose simple Visual Basic code statements, add forms to a project and set the startup form, run a project's executable file, write an assignment statement, print an application's code and interface, find and correct syntax errors, and package or zip a solution for submission and grading. Let's take a look at how to start up our Visual Studio environment and also how to configure some of the important default settings for Visual Studio. So you'll notice that I have my um, Visual Studio pinned to my taskbar. Let me go ahead and unpin that. Um, I think that's the most convenient way if you use it frequently to work with it. So now I've set it back to default. It's not on my taskbar. So how would you start Visual Studio? Well, uh, click on the Windows Start button. And if you've used it current, frequently or recently, it's probably right up there near the top. Otherwise, you can scroll down and go find it. Also, if you start to type its name, V-I-S-U-A-L, um, it'll find it very quickly. This is also where, uh, in addition to starting the program, if it's not on your um, uh, taskbar, if it's not pinned, uh, and you would like it to be so, if you right-click here, and tell it pin to the taskbar. Notice it has appeared down here, and then we can start it either place. I like it down here. It's real quick and easy. It's uh, you know at a glance it's on my desktop, a commonly used tool for me. And I go ahead and click that, and Visual Studio will load. Okay, so once that's set, you're good to start every time. Now, the very first time you start Visual Studio, it will will prompt you about what kind of projects you want to routine, routinely build. Um, uh, we're going to be using almost exclusively, well, for this class, it will be exclusively Visual Basic projects. Uh, this is the general view. And in the general view, when I say File, uh, New, Project, what we're going to see is um, that there are all these different programming languages. And depending on how what version of Visual Studio you're running, which edition, and what uh, language tools you have installed. Um, there can be quite a few of them, and it may not necessarily, if you haven't run, you know, if the last thing you, you uh, opened or haven't opened something before uh, wasn't Visual Basic, uh, you may get a different language by default. And every term, it seems I get one or two students who are struggling and trying to, to do their assignments, and uh, the first, especially the first week, and they're having a terrible time because the you know what they're typing you know doesn't seem to match uh, what my instructions are, and that's because they're actually in a totally different language. You can imagine uh, how confusing that would be. So uh, take care to make sure you're in Visual Basic. You can leave it in the general setting, but if you would like to change that so that from uh, here on forward it uh, um, defaults to uh, Visual Basic. Uh, we can come up here in the uh, 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 settings. Let's use the tools and go to the import and export settings. And I'm just going to go ahead and reset all settings. And I'm not going to bother to save my current settings. We could have multiple sets saved for, for really sophisticated programmers that use two or three different languages. And, and you like your settings to be set a little differently for each environment. You can do that. Um, we don't need that. So I'm going to just say no, reset my settings, and overwrite, and next. And if I change it from general and come down here and make the default Visual Basic and uh, finish that out, and close it. So now when I go into File, New Project, 
it's going to take me right to Visual Basic directly, and here are all the different kinds of projects that I can create in Visual Basic. And again, for this class, for the uh, VB exercises and assignments that you'll be doing, uh, we're going to be working with Windows Forms applications. Um, if you explore the um, Flowgorithm tool and uh, you know build a visual uh, logic uh, using Flowgorithm and then want to export the source code, the, the version of the project that supports that VB source code, remember, is the uh, console app with the .NET framework. And so um, that would be useful if you'd like to um, you know, start with, with uh, Flowgorithm for some projects to help you visually construct your logic and then slowly uh, port it over to VB and then update it to uh, the code so you can move it into the, the GUI, the forms uh, version uh, with a graphical user interface. Um, that's something you can do as a, a technique and that's a very clever learning technique that you can apply. All right, so let's take a look at uh, some other common settings. Uh, back end tools, let's look at the options. There are a lot of them, but some of the uh, most common that you might be interested in uh, lie under projects and solutions. Um, and let's take a look first at the locations. So this determines where uh, your default projects and templates are going to be stored. Um, generally, you're not going to want to touch those, um, and uh, those should be fine. As a matter of fact, most of the settings we're looking at today would be just fine with the defaults. Um, another uh, issue we want to take a look at is um, with the debugger. So these are all your preferences for the debugger, and uh, we can turn features on or off again. Um, most of the defaults here are pretty intelligent and work really well with this class, uh, so you shouldn't have to change anything. Okay, and then the other is uh, uh, some of your build and run options, um, your ASP net core, uh, net core, uh, and general options, and then the specific VB defaults. Some of these settings uh, at this point are going to seem pretty arcane. Um, option explicit, explicit, option strict, and what do those do? Don't worry about that too much at this point. Uh, we will delve into one or two of those that are important for you to know about as the course goes on. Um, nothing to worry about. For the most part, we're not really going to be getting into to those. And day to day it's it's unusual as a programmer that you would have to come and do very much tweaking in this but this is where you find it if you need to okay and then let's take a look at one other thing let's go ahead and start a windows project file new project and uh, we'll start a windows form app project and you'll notice when the project first opens, I will have a lot of different panels on my screen, and some of them are pretty intuitive as to what we're doing, what we're working with. So this is the, the Windows form right here that uh, we're going to create, and uh, we can actually just run that on an empty Windows form, and it'll pop up and, and run. So it has nothing on it. So it's compiling and building the empty form code, and now it's running the program. And here's our actual Windows application that does absolutely nothing. Um, but um, so just to demonstrate, that's where what my form looks like in the form design view. But I can also uh, look at Windows for the project solution and properties. And an important one, notice I can move these. I can also change them so that they automatically um, pop out. So they become tabs over here. And so they can be pinned or unpinned. And if I wanted to change the Solution Explorer so it stays out, I can change the auto height, change the pin. And now it stays in view. And um, same thing with my properties, make that stay in view. 
Um, there's a whole bunch of other windows that are sometimes useful and more useful for some tasks and projects than others. I can also resize them. Okay, one really useful window that we'll be uh, getting accustomed to or getting introduced to soon is uh, the tools window, uh, the toolbox. And so if I want to take a look, let's view the, 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 the toolbox. And let's see, where did we hide it? Oh, there we are, view toolbox. Okay, so here's, here's my toolbox that has all the form controls like buttons and list boxes and text boxes. And I can move where this is going to be. Now, if it's in front of my form, that's not very useful. What I'd really like to do is kind of have it docked off to the side. And if you notice this docker tool in the middle here, we can say, well, where would you like it docked? And I'll say, well, dock it to the right side of my form. And let's move it over so we have a little bit more room. And now if I want to start creating my uh, Windows form, so I want a button on my form, I can drag out a button. And then maybe I want uh, a label over here that says something descriptive. And maybe I want a text box that I'm going to um, put messages to for the user. I'll drag the, the uh, text box in and I'll make it a little bit bigger and do things like that. Okay, so this toolbox is really useful, but if I totally, let's totally mess up our environment and put the, the windows in crazy places. Okay, so that, that's not a very useful layout there. I can't even see the code that I'm working on or the, the visual form that I'm working on. Uh, we can come in and uh, in tools and, and we can very quickly uh, reset the, uh, the the view and so if we come into let's see is it under options and uh, no that's uh, under windows so under window and we can um, uh, reset the window layout very quickly here by just hitting the reset window layout. Am I sure? Yeah, put it back to the default. Good. Oh, now everything's back the way it was and I can start customizing again. So the other thing that can be really useful is uh, um, you know, using the mouse is fine, but it's even faster if you know the shortcut keys. And all of our menu items have accelerator keys, uh, but they're not showing at present. If I hold the Alt key down, it turned on the underline showing which is the accelerator key for each individual item. So for instance, if I wanted to um, start debugging, now that I've hit the Alt key once and the D is underscored, if I press D, it brings up my debugging window and I can quickly use the arrow key to go down and start the, the debugger. And there's my project running with the debugger and um, we can see what it does to performance and where there are bugs in the project and all that kind of stuff as, as we're running. Set breakpoints and things we'll learn about later. Okay, so, but that's um, that's handy to have. Um, there is a way to, to uh, set those accessibility keys on um, if you uh, want them on all the time. Um, uh, you can reference that in your textbook. Uh, it takes you outside uh, of uh, Visual Studio and into Windows is in one of the accessibility settings where you can set the accelerator keys so they're on all the time, which is really helpful if you're dealing with someone who is mobility limited and they're using a, a tongue stick or a um, eye tracking or other things in order to control the mouse and move around the screen. Okay, so again, Alt will turn it on, Alt will turn it off. Uh, once it's on, uh, you can um, uh, use the letter one time. So if we wanted to look at the tools menu, I'll press T and brings up the, the, the tools menu without having to move the mouse. So that's the accelerator keys.
Let's practice creating a new Windows Forms project and also exploring the toolbox um, controls a little bit uh, further. So uh, I've got my Visual Studio pinned to the taskbar. I'm going to go ahead and click on it to start things up. And I'm going to say File, New Project. And this will be a Windows Forms app. And you can give this uh, a name. I'll call it Lecture Demo and tell it OK. And I've got a default form here. And I'm going to make my errorless window a little smaller. I don't need quite that large a Windows form for this demo. And uh, I'm going to make a little bit more screen real estate here. And uh, let's also uh, view the toolbox. So let's see. Um, uh, in uh, Oh, in view, the toolbox is here. You can also get it quickly with the accelerator uh, shortcut key control alt X. And there's my toolbox. And I think I would like to dock that in right over there. And I don't need quite that much screen real estate for my Solution Explorer or my properties. Matter of fact, I think I will uh, just make my Solution Explorer pop in and out so I have a nice large toolbox because I'm going to use that a lot. OK. So let's see how we um, can add tools from the toolbox. So one way to do it is uh, there's like at least three different ways to do this, and they're all good ways. If I click on button and then click on the uh, form, a button is deposited there. I'm going to drag and lasso it to select it and hit the delete key to get rid of it. I could also click on button and click and drag it out is another good way. And again, I'm going to lasso it. I could also select it just by clicking on it and delete it. And then uh, the other way I could do that on button, if I just double click, it will pop it onto the form. It's always going to pop it in the upper left hand corner. And then I can drag it where I want. Also, the handlebars on the control, once the control is selected, um, we can adjust the size. Some controls will allow you to resize them, some will not. Some may be constrained horizontally or vertically. Um, the other thing that we can do here with this button, we can change those properties. That would be the width and the height of that button. Notice that when the button is in context, the properties window is referring to the button. And uh, we can come down here and see it says what the size is, 190 by 66. So it is wider than it is tall. So the, the 190 must be the width. Let's see if that's true. What if we change the, the, the width to 100? And watch what happens when I hit the Enter key. Ah, the button resized. And what about the height? Instead of 66, what if I make it 34? Ah, and it gets shorter, OK? And other things like the, the location of it and the text alignment in the button, all kinds of properties of that object are listed here in the properties. And so if we want to set something really exact, we can do so here. If we're just laying things out by eye, we could kind of stretch and pull and size things up. OK, so there's the button. Now, Visually, you're working on the GUI, and that makes sense to, to build visual things with a visual designer. But what about the code for this program? Where does the code go? Well, let's add one more control. So I can show you a couple other fun things while we're here. Let's add a text box. And text box contain text. Notice this is one of those controls. I can make it wider, but I can't make it taller. Um, and uh, why would that be? Well, text box is only really intended by default to hold uh, uh, 
you know a short amount of text we could change the properties on that so that it supports multiple lines in which case we would uh, be able to resize it uh, um, in terms of its its height as as well so let's see here change it to a multi-line text box tell that true as soon as that is is the case oh look I can resize it now because it can hold more than one line of text okay all right one other thing I want to show you about selecting you can select individual controls and then move them around by clicking on them if I hold the shift key down I can select multiple controls and then move them all together the other thing that sometimes is is uh, easier is I can lasso only the controls I want and it will select them and then I can move them or change their properties okay so we've got a text box we've got a button back to the question of where's the code okay so we're looking at form1.vb that is my form design okay and if I double click on the button one object it now has added a new tab up here which is form1.vb this is form1vb design so there's still we didn't lose it there's my form design the visual and here's the code behind and in the the, the code for that form it has taken me to it's created for me a new actually a button handler and the default event for a button is button one click okay so the click event is going to be the container of the code that will run when the button is clicked okay so what was our other object here this object here is currently named text box one so text box one has a text property that is currently empty and let's go to our button one click event and let's start typing and say when button one is clicked let's make text box one have the text property change to being equal to hi there okay and so now we've created code that is wired up to that click event so this is event driven programming so we're doing all kinds of programming here are we using procedural programming yes are we using object oriented programming yes because we're dealing with graphical objects and each of these objects have properties all the width and height and all that kind of stuff color um, and they also have methods so um, like uh, the method the, the click event method that uh, is uh, is fired off when we click on the, the button and so boy we're learning several programming paradigms all at once let's go ahead and run the code that we have and see what that does take a moment and guess what do you think that our code does so far so the only code we've added is for the click event and so the the click handler is going to handle that event and when that event fires off it's been clicked it's going to change the text property of this text box from nothing to the message hi there so let's see if your theory is right about what happens we hit start it does the build I notice that the um, error list has changed to the immediate window that's a window that's going to uh, be something we can use to issue commands um, or change things that are running while the program is running but let's see what happens when we actually click that button so here's the running program and click the button and ah hi there shows up now if we do it again it's just changing the text from hi there to hi there so we're not seeing any change All right 
if we go and delete it out manually, ah, it's still working. We put it back. There it is. All right, so, so much for um, creating a new project. And uh, then, of course, if we want to save the project, we've end the run. So the, the debugging is has stopped. And we can go ahead and hit Save All. And say Save. And this is where it's going to be saved. When we first created it, if we wanted to put the, the file somewhere else, that's where we would have changed that. Um, this is probably a poor time to change the location, but that's uh, um, something we could do. Um, but if you're looking for, oh, where did my project go? This is where you can find it. Let's uh, go ahead and copy that and save that. Oh. There we go. And uh, now if we were to run our file explorer, and paste that in. We will find here are our projects and here's the lex lecture demo folder with all of the resources for the Visual Studio project that we just built. All right. And having saved it, the other thing we can do to save it is we can save everything. We can save the, the file we're currently working on if it's changed. And we can also go to File and do that through the menus and, and tell it to Save All. And it's also telling us that the accelerator key is Control-Shift-F-S if we want to do that from the, the keyboard. And now we can close our project and it's all safely saved. We can come back and work on it some more later by reopening Visual Studio and reopening the project. Let's rebuild our last project example and use that to discuss some important aspects of naming practices for uh, objects, controls, and variables. Um, and we'll see why that's important to have some conventions, um, uh, some standards that will help. It's, it's good to have useful names for things, things that are descriptive and kind of intuitive, because in a large project, we're going to have many, many forms with dozens of, if not hundreds, of controls and goodness knows how many variables and other things in our programs. And if they're all named things like text box 1, text box 2, text box 368, um, it's going to get a little bit confusing. So we can make things a little bit more meaningful. And there are conventions for uh, naming. Uh, the books outline uh, outlined some uh, different naming conventions. There are many others that have been used historically in practice and are in use today. Um, and uh, although there's been some consolidation, um, we still find a wide variety of practice depending on what company or organization you're working for. And we tend to call the, the, the programming shop or the IT shop uh, of a company uh, the, the shop and we'll have a shop standard. So what your company does with their code, it's you need to comply with those practices. And uh, it's likely that if you're in this industry for any length of time, your shop standards will change both within a shop and as you go from employer to employer, e even from department to department, the shop standards may change somewhat. So let's let's see what that looks like and why we need these. So uh, I'm gonna add a button and I'm going to add your um, uh, text box back in. And you know that text box is uh, not really clear what that's doing. Um, it's just hanging out here. What is that supposed to tell us? And this button, button one is not uh, really uh, very useful either. So we ought to provide some useful text and maybe some way to describe what this text box is intended to do. For the text box, let's bring in a label. And we'll put that, we'll align it next to it. Notice I'm getting a little alignment tool that helps me to do that. And uh, so uh, 
what should the, the, the label say? Well, if we come down here to the properties and we look at the text that is displayed, um, uh, uh, let's call it the message. And let's back it off just a little bit. There we go. So there's the message. And on our button, let's change the text to display message. And we'll need to make that a little bit wider so you can see what, what the button does. Let's beautify this a little bit, kind of line it up. Great. OK. Now, this is button one right now. Button one, when we have 20 or 30 buttons uh, in our project, is not going to be very useful. So how about we come in here and not change the text, but there is also the name of the control is another property. So let's change the control from button one. What would be a useful, meaningful thing to name this? Well, we could name it um, display message, no spaces, can't have spaces in, it's, well, poor, poor idea to have spaces in the name even if in, in cases where it's allowed and in variables and whatnot, spaces are not allowed. But notice, notice we have display message. Well, wouldn't that be an equally good description for the text box up here. So we probably need to say this is a button. How would we tell it that is a button? Um, one old standard is to prefix the um, name with the control type, btn for buttons, txt for text. That is uh, an older naming convention still widely used. Um, another convention that is used is to underscore affix the control type at the end. I don't like that as much. It makes the, the name rather long. Um, the other thing we ought to talk about is um, some rules for, for naming and making them readable and memorable. Okay, So we could call it display message button and boy, what an awful mess that is to read. Okay, so there are a couple of conventions for how you typographically capitalize this thing so it is less difficult for your eye to process when you're used to seeing spaces in, in words and sentences. Okay, one is what they call camel case. Camel case says leave the first word in the name or the description lowercase and capitalize the start of every word after that. So that's camel case. It's very similar or derivative from something called Pascal case. Pascal case says just capitalize the first letter of every word. Okay. Um, I don't really care uh, unless the instructions for your exercises are specific from the textbook. Uh, I don't care what naming convention you use. I do care that you use a meaningful name. I do think that it should um, identify the type of control and give the control a reasonably short but meaningful name that allows you to identify what that is when you're reading code without having to trace back and go, okay, which control was I working on again? What does that do? Um, because again, when you have 10 or 12 buttons on a form, which you might, um, remembering which one does what if they're named something like button one could be kind of a mess. So how about we use this convention? This is what I grew up with. And uh, button display message. And how about we change this to MSG, display message. We could even maybe disp message, but there we go. Button display message. And now when we double click that to look at the code behind, it has created that not as button one, but as button display message click. Okay, let's go back and look at our design and let's change the um, text box 
and this is the text box that's going to be um, uh, the displayed message. And so um, let's perhaps change the name of this and we could call it TB or how about TXT for text box and um, uh, uh, oh maybe give it a slightly different name so it's not too confusing but still similar um, how about um, um, text show message or even text MSG great and so that's useful because we're going to be referring to that. So when we make code, for example, we might uh, say txt message.text equals hi there. Okay. And now here's a quick checkpoint for your thinking. Here's our label. Our label also has a name and we could call it LBL something. Is it worth bothering changing the default names for labels? This requires a little careful thinking. Think about this for a second. My button, I may reference programmatically. My text box, I'm certainly going to reference programmatically. Since I'm never ordinarily going to select a label or click on it or do anything else with it, does it matter if it has a meaningful name for the label control? Or could I just let it be label one, label two, label three? Yeah, it probably isn't all that important. So it's okay, generally speaking, and again, this will change with your shop standard. See what your, your uh, uh, project manager and your uh, IT manager uh, say is uh, the, the, the shop practice. But generally speaking, it is deemed uh, reasonable to leave those alone and let them use the default names and otherwise we have meaningful names and that is how we uh, create those meaningful names and those are the naming conventions that are typically used so again we have the prefix method btn txt uh, you can make yours up but there are lists of standard abbreviations uh, that can be found um, we either pascal case or camel case uh, our control names as well as our variable names and again um, there's no hard and fast rule the code will work with or without that convention but it makes code much more manageable and easy to deal with and there will be a rule though i say there's no hard and fast rule there certainly is a rule as to your shop standard and um, you should learn and comply with what your shop standard is so Picking one for this term and practicing it is an excellent idea, and I strongly recommend that you do that. Now let's look at the formatting menu and how that can help us to get some visually um, and aesthetically pleasing results, uh, as well as communicating clearly through our user interface. So um, here's our uh, project that uh, we've been working on only I've dragged some things around and messed with them now as we drag them you notice that there are certain alignment lines that show up that can help me to manually line things up but it would be really nice to be able to do some of that um, automatically okay well, let's add one other control because I want to also introduce you to something called order or uh, as it's known, tab order. So let's go over and we're going to add a second button to quit our project. So let's grab a button and drag it out here. And uh, let's change the text. Let's change the, the name. We'll call it uh, button quit. And then let's uh, change what it displays to uh, how about exit. Okay, and uh, let's uh, just explore for a moment what tab order is before we go any further. So let me uh, go ahead and uh, uh, run this program. 
So to someone that is using a mouse, you can select what do I, where do I want to be, um, what do I want to type, and then what do I want to do. Um, and so you can do things in pretty much any order. But remember that uh, some of your users may not be using the mouse. It's actually quicker to not use the mouse if you can learn the accelerator keys. And now I'm using the tab key. And notice that it goes, I, my first tab goes to the text, but then to the exit button, and then to display message. Well, probably I want to you know, do it in a more natural order and the last thing I want to land on is the exit button. Can I change that? Can I control that? Well, yes, I can. We can change the ordering. Let's see if our exit button is working. Ah, it's not because we didn't code it. Okay, so let's fix the, the exit button so it works, and let's fix the tab order. Okay, so let's double click on our exit button, and notice that we're still taken to the form object code, but to specifically the subroutine for the button quick uh, click uh, button quit click say that six times fast um, and let's um, tell that we want the current object to close me dot close and we'll uh, revisit why me is a particularly useful construct let's test that. Yay, okay, so that's working now. And let's see about setting the tab order here. So if I were to highlight those objects and go to format and um, change the order, well, let's see, the order here is going to be uh, bringing things front to back if they're overlaid. So that's not quite what we're looking for. So what we're looking for is called the tab order. and um, And let's take a look at a property of the control. This is the text control called tab index. So this one is set to tab index one. You might think that's the first one, but remember in programming, real programmers start counting at zero. So our display message is set to zero. Our display is set to one and exit is set to three. So if we were to say, well, I want the tab stop, the tab index to be first for this one. Let's make that one 10. And secondly, for this one. So let's make that one 20. And let's make this one 30. And here's a quick checkpoint question for you. What about the tab index for the label? What should that be set to? Think about it. Okay, it's currently set to two, but do I want there to be a tab index on the label? Is there any reason to stop and select a label? Okay, let's just set it to 100 for the time being and see what happens. Let's run that. Okay. So I'm in the text box. I'll hit tab one time, came to display message. And if I did this properly next to exit, and then look what's happening. Even though the message label has a tab index, it's not a selectable item. Notice I can't select it with my mouse either. So it doesn't matter what the tab index was set to, but I have controlled everything else. All right, let's exit this and let's try and clean up this mess. Doesn't this look an awful mess? This is not a very useful form. Okay, so we can use the format menu. Let's say, where, what do we want to base everything around? Well, let's say we want this control in the center horizontally and let's make it center and form vertically. Okay, and then what if we then say, you know, I'd really like this to be I'm gonna hold my control key down and click so now I've got two selected and let's format 
those so that they are aligned with their centers aligned one over the other. Up, oh, I got the I got it dragged the wrong way. Control Z will undo it. And let's see, I clicked that one, and then I clicked that one, and format align their centers. Ah, notice that the second one that I clicked follows the first one, so the order in which I select them matters. And there we go. This is actually a little bit high, so let me go ahead and hold the shift key down and drag it so I see the alignment and make that about there. And what I'd really like to do is I'd like to get the, the message aligned to this nicely. Now, I can do it manually, right? But I can also do it, I want to align with that. I'll select it first, shift or control, and click the next thing, and format. And how would I like to align those? Let's align their, their tops. So it's on the same height. Okay, and let's bring this in. Oh, Control Z. Bring this guy in a little bit closer. There we go. And if I if I got it, maybe I nudged it a little bit out of out of line. I can fix it by this is the one I want to control to. Select it first, control and the message, and format, and let's align their tops. Okay, there we go. Now, I would like to take the, the um, this one and align to it this one and align by center. Format, uh, horizontal, let's see, align their centers. And you know there's more space here than there is here. So what about format, vertical spacing, make equal. Ah, oh, cool. Okay, anything else we should explore here? Center and form, uh, order, ah, lock controls. So the other thing that we can do, generally speaking, the controls are not movable by the user, uh, but we can also lock our controls down so they can't be nudged or moved accidentally. Once we've got them laid out the way we intend, we have to intentionally unlock them. So let's let's take a look at that. So if I take this one and this one and this one and let's lock those controls, it'll lock there. Now I go to grab it and try and drag it and I can't accidentally drag it, but if I drag this one, oh, that one I got locked as well. Did I get everything locked? Yeah, okay, so let's take, I need to actually come in and under unlock the control so that I can move it. So locking the controls once we got them laid out is a nice thing to do because they can't be moved accidentally. Let's run our code. There it is, tab, 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 like we would expect. Display the message, nice exit, and it ends. So that's our uh, layout manager uh, through the, the format uh, function and uh, uh, also an exploration of the tab order. Most significant uh, Windows form applications are going to have multiple forms. And although it's going to be a number of weeks before we get into that level of sophistication, let's take uh, a forward looking glance at uh, what it takes to add forms and then control which form is going to be the default form that is displayed when the application starts up. So right now we have our one form one object uh, uh, in the application. We need to add another form. So we can do that in the uh, Solution Explorer if we come and then right click in the Solution Explorer and tell it we'd like to add and we want to add a uh, uh, new Windows form. And we'll just make this form, Windows form, form two, and add that. And let's say we wanted this to be our splash screen that uh, comes up first. And then um, when we push a button, uh, it uh, hides itself and uh, uh, takes us to displaying the uh, 
uh, primary windows form for our application. So it'd be kind of like a, a, a splash screen or, or title or credit screen. I'll make this a little bit smaller just for uh, convenience sake. And uh, let's, from the toolbox, we'll add uh, a button and uh, let's add uh, a label and uh, let's change our label text and it says um, uh, welcome to the program. Click go to continue. Okay, so there's our uh, form. We could also, if you wanted to make that a little bit larger and more impressive, we could play around with the size and the and the font and all that. Um, I'm going to leave that uh, for later. And then let's take this button and uh, let's change its uh, name to, um, let's call, change the text to uh, go, and uh, let's change its name to uh, button dot, button go, button go, okay. And then let's uh, edit the uh, event. So what we want to have happen is, um, uh, when that form, when that button is fired off, we would like uh, form two to be uh, hidden. So let's uh, start by activating form one. So. form one dot activate. And let's see what happens at this point if we run the code. All right, so notice form one is still the form that can't come up, it comes up because that's the form we started with. And we don't have any way here to go to our splash screen. We want our splash screen to start first. So how do we change the default form? Uh, the way we do that is if we come into the Solution Explorer and just on the, the name of the project, so Lecture Demo Project, um, let's change the properties here. And instead of a little properties panel, this actually gives us a more interactive panel. And one of the things we can do is change the startup form. So let's change the startup form to form two. And uh, let's uh, save everything. And uh, we can put that back away. Now let's run it and see what happens. Okay, so now we have our splash screen. And what happens if we just do a form activate on form one? Let's see, did we get our code coded? Doesn't seem to be doing the job, so let's see what else we have to do to complete the code. So let's take uh, form one and use the show method. And uh, form two, that's this object, so it needs to refer to itself as me, uh, dot hide and that will hide the uh, splash screen. So let's give this a, a shot and see if it now does what we intend. So here's our splash screen being in, uh, displayed and click on it and the other form is activated and displayed and our splash screen form is hidden away. And this is now working and we exit the program. So there you are adding in a forms and controlling which form is the active form, and also a little demo on how one form can um, activate and show um, uh, another or hide itself. 
You know, often we get so caught up in this course in using Visual Studio and uh, creating and debugging our projects that uh, we lose sight of the fact that ultimately the purpose of uh, developing the program is to create an executable that can run standalone outside of the Visual Studio environment. So let's set Visual Studio aside for just a moment and uh, demonstrate that we've actually done just that. So I'm going to open up the File Explorer and uh, go to the uh, path where we uh, um, stored this uh, project that we've been using as a demo. And here's the lecture demo. And if I drill down in here to the lecture demo folder, and right now we're building in debug mode, so in bin debug, we'll find that there is the lecture demo executable. and so totally outside of Visual Studio, if I were to double click and run this program, look, I'm running this without being in the context of uh, Visual Studio. So we actually have built a standalone Windows program and uh, it will work as it did and um, as intended, just as it shows in the Visual Studio debugging environment. But here we have the standalone program running exactly as it should. So we really are building real Windows uh, programs and uh, we could uh, package this up with uh, 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 an installer tool such as Install Shield or uh, make an, an installation project and make a professional installer that we could then distribute to our customers uh, or uh, clients uh, on CD or DVD or uh, through digital download or what have you. So just to take a moment and show that we actually are building real standalone Windows programs. These days there's not a lot of call for printing and saving um, archived hard copy of our uh, programs that we develop on the uh, program code itself is really the best documentation uh, for that, but still that's something we should probably know how to do and understand some of the limitations on it. So let's take a look. If we go to File and Print, notice that Print is grayed out, and that's because my current view is of the form, and Windows is not going to, uh, that is to say Visual Studio, is not going to print the form. I need to be looking at the code view of the form. That's the printable object here. So file, print, and uh, uh, since uh, this is an online demonstration, I'm going to print it to Adobe uh, PDF. Uh, I'll print it out to my Adobe PDF printer. We'll make a, a, a PDF object. Let's just call it uh, form one. I'll overwrite the, uh, the old one that I had previously saved. And yep, replace it. And uh, uh, Adobe Acrobat is doing its thing just as your hard copy printer would. And so here is our nicely formatted source code, and we could save that for archiving. But what about the, uh, the user interface? Because having to construct or reconstruct the user interface without any visual cues, just knowing what controls are there, uh, could be a little bit problematic. So probably the best way if we need to do that is to um, uh, use the Windows snipping tool. So here I have a shortcut to the Windows snipping tool. You could also do a screen print. I'm going to say take a new snip and uh, let's uh, grab this tool here. Let's grab a copy of the form. And now I have a copy of the image. Edit, copy it, and then uh, bring up whatever tool I'm using to document my project. So here's Microsoft Word. Uh, here is screen one and paste the contents of the screen uh, snipping tool in and I can then save and print my Word document. Uh, in this class you're going to be submitting all of your actual uh, executable projects. I like to be able to evaluate by testing rather than looking and trying to evaluate what your code does just by sight reading it. That's not really optimal. So uh, printing is not going to play uh, a huge role in this class for the most part. Some of your um, uh, uh, flowgorithm exercises, I may have you do some screen prints, but for the most part we're not going to be doing this. But this is how you would address that uh, should the rights to uh, print hard copies of your source code. 
As we've seen previously, syntax errors are usually caused by a misspelling or mistyping of a, an object name or a method or keyword. Uh, let's uh, create a, a syntax error here by taking out the uh, O in close. And syntax errors, again, uh, unlike logic errors, syntax errors, because they're the rules of the regular grammar of the programming language we're using, usually those can be automatically detected. And so um, at uh, design time, um, we will see IntelliSense give us a squiggly red line telling us we need to co correct that. Um, if we miss it or if we're um, working on some fairly complex code and, and uh, uh, something we do um, you know, might be multiple lines down, so it is possible to, to miss when you, you know, if I have a very, very, very long line and, you know, uh, it didn't know until I get several lines below and then in the statement that I've made a syntax error. Um, it is possible that you might miss it when you're first creating the code, or you might even ignore it because you've got uh, some other tasks you want to get on with and you're going to, you intend to come back and fix it and then uh, you get distracted, it's quitting time, you come back the next day, uh, that kind of thing. Um, so, uh, it is possible to create syntax errors that you uh, don't catch at the time. Uh, and uh, let's have an example of one that's kind of hidden. So right now we're looking at the code. It's real obvious there's a syntax error there. But if we were over in the design view, um, that uh, syntax error is hidden. When we go to do the build or when we go to run in debug, which is going to um, compile the latest change code, uh, it's going to tell us, hey, there was an error. And if we have a previously working version of the code, it says, do you want to run the last version of the build that, that, that worked? Generally speaking, we don't want to do that because uh, uh, you'll you'll think that you have working code. You forget that hey, hey this this current build, the, the thing they changed most recently, that by the way the instructor is going to be grading, um, has a problem, won't compile, and if code doesn't compile cleanly, that's a total non-starter for me. I won't even evaluate it. I'll send it back to you uh, if it's before deadline, and of course if it, it's if it's after deadline. Um, you're going to get a zero for that assignment, so that would be ugly. So let's uh, tell it, uh, would I like to run the last successful build? No. And one other nifty trick. This tells us what is going on. Uh, the error codes are actually pretty descriptive and pretty clear. Um, there's also an error code number we could look up um, in the Microsoft documentation. What is a BC30456 error? And get some more background on that. But probably the most convenient thing to do is if you simply want to go fix the code, fix the problem, double click and it will take you right to the line of code that has the error. You can make the correction and then try again to run or, or build the code and see if it builds uh, cleanly this time. Yay, and off we go. Let's take a look at another important skill, and that is how do we package up our um, work that we've been working on for our assignments or exercises to submit it for grading. And it's important that I get your entire project, and that in includes many, many different files and resources that are created by your Visual Studio solution. So let's take a look at how to do that. So here I have the solution. The first thing I need to do is save it and let's close it uh, just to be on the safe side. Um, trying to package up a solution while it's running or open is a lot like trying to uh, work on your car while it's driving down the road. Um, you're likely to uh, have things go very badly. So uh, we'll close this, make sure the project's been saved and closed. Let's open up your um, Windows Ex File Explorer, and we're going to go into the directory, whatever directory you were creating your projects in. And we will see here, here is the lecture demo that we've been working on. And if we take a look inside this folder, 
we'll see that there is the solution file that actually has no code in it. That's this the settings that are specific to that solution. Okay, all the different resources and paths and things are stored in there. And then uh, the lecture demo itself, here are all these different resources. If I do not have all of them, I cannot compile and run your program. And if I cannot compile and run it, um, that's just a zero. It's not properly submitted. So it's important to get that. So let's back up and go to the top level view. So here we are, there's the complete folder with all its subfolders and all the files within it. Let's right click on it in Windows and tell it that we would like to send that to a zip folder. Okay, so now I have the zip folder which is like an envelope that, that has packaged and contained all of the files. As a matter of fact, if we look inside it, we will see now in compressed form are all the resources that we need in order for the instructor to compile and test and run the, the, the program. And so this zip folder is what I need you to submit. Make sure that all the resources are in it. If you copy things or move things around or put them in uh, other folders in relationship or you import or link them externally, um, anything that were to get left behind would mean that I wouldn't have all the resources. So trying to make sure that you are working with all your resources in the folder, wherever you put it, that you create for the project, zip the entire folder, and then this is what you upload and submit to Canvas. This concludes the lesson.